Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse 158, which reads as follows. Atana meva patamang patirupe niwesaye Atanyam manusaseya nakideseya pandito Which means One should set oneself in what is right first then if one should teach others it will not be sullied not kiles, the wise will not sully themselves or will not be defiled when they teach others because they've set themselves in what is right so this was told in regards to uh, Upananda Thera. Upananda was a Sakya, he was a relative of the Buddha and so used to a life of luxury. When he became a monk he had a hard time giving that up and he was he was a greedy monk. And not only that but he was somewhat crooked as we'll see. He he had a lot of possessions and he went around from monastery to monastery collecting possessions. He heard a teaching of the Buddha once on uh, fewness of wishes, apicca, apicata, apicata di patisangyutang dhammakata. So he heard a dhamma talk that um, was connected with many things including the fewness of wishes wanting little right? this idea that wanting is never going to make you happy the more you want well the more you get but then the more you want and you'll always, there's, you're always wanting the only way to be truly happy is to be content to be have few or have, have no wishes, no wants, then you can be truly happy. So he heard this teaching and he made good use of it in his mind. He went around preaching it to others. And he found that by preaching it to others, uh, they would give up all their stuff. And so as a result, he was able to collect even more, both because he was apparently a fairly proficient teacher but also because the teaching itself inclined people to, to discard things. <laughs> and so when it came time for the rains, he went around to various monasteries and, and left some of his belongings in the various monasteries. And when, at the end of the rains, when they were divvying up the, the gifts that had been given in support of the monks who had kept the rains retreat, he took a portion from each of these monasteries because he had made it seem like he was living in, in each of these four monasteries. And by this time he had so much stuff that he had to put it on a cart, and so he's carting the stuff around. And he comes upon these two monks who are trying to uh, split up their possessions. They've acquired two pieces of cloth and one piece of wool. And the wool is of course very you know, expensive, it's, maybe it's cashmere or something. And so they look and they see, oh, here comes that monk who teaches about fewness of wishes. Well, he'll be able to, to teach us the right way to divide these things so that we're not cheating each other. And Upananda looks at this and he sees the, this luxurious wool blanket. And he says, okay, I can fix this for you. And he gives one piece of cloth to one monk, the other piece of cloth to the other monk. And he says, I'll take the blanket for myself. There, decided and walks away. And suffice to say, these two monks are not really happy with his method of dividing the possessions. And so they go see the Buddha. And the Buddha, oh, the Buddha tells them a story of his past life. He says in the past, Upananda was the same. And he tells one of the Jataka stories about a jackal who divided up a fish for two otters, I think. Same sort of idea. And the Buddha said, and then the Buddha, what did he do? He just 
complained about Upananda himself. He said, Upananda is acting, no monk should act in this way. And in general, one should practice which one, what one preaches. You know, one should set oneself in what is right first. Only then, should, if one wishes, only then should one teach. Because your teaching is marred otherwise, right? That's what this verse is about. If you don't practice what you preach, it's, it, there's, there's something wrong with it. I mean, it's, it's quite likely to be an a incomplete or a skewed teaching based on your inner defilement or your inner uh, inconsistency, you know, the fact that you yourself haven't internalized the teaching. And so that's the, the, the most obvious message in this verse, that we should practice what we preach. But there's more to it, I think, and I think it, it points to a more general teaching of the difference between uh, externalizing something and internalizing it, the outward gaze and the inward gaze, right? And Buddhism has this sort of quandary. I mean, actually, in ancient India, there was this uh, dilemma of whether one should um, work on one's own, you know, go off into the forest and work on one's own uh, mental powers or mental abilities or work for one's own freedom and enlightenment or whether one should stay at home and, and look after your family and, and be a productive member of society. So in Buddhism, of course, this problem was should we go and help others, teach others, bring other people to become enlightened or should we seek out enlightenment for ourselves and what's the place of the two of them? Now, this verse is a clear coming down on the side of helping yourself, but it also makes clear that there are these two aspects, the, the, um, our expression and our uh, personality, our, our state of, of mind, that which we express with, right? And it's far too common for people who, especially with those who come, or even those who come to Buddhism, to favor the outward expression. So they might favor outward practices of love and compassion. They might favor outward expressions of wisdom, of debating and discussing and explaining and teaching to others. Um, they may become all preachy and, and arrogant and denouncing those who don't practice according to the teachings um, when they themselves aren't necessarily practicing them either. And so there's nothing wrong with many of those things, right? But they're very much dependent, or they should be defend dependent, and they're very much um, below in terms of benefit, in terms of the outcome, um, the inward cultivation of, of these states. And so and it's very easy to think of the Buddhist teachings intellectually and think, well, yes, I, I understand that intellectually. And then you say, well, then I'll go and share that with other people. So in this case, he may have even thought that he was doing the right thing and may not even have connected, you know. We have this disconnect between our intellectual understanding and our experiential understanding. So I can intellectually say that this is bad and that is bad. And so I say anger is bad, but then I might still get angry, or greed is bad, but I might still want things. And so in terms just of, of benefit, of what actually uh, leads to success, progress, happiness, peace, freedom from suffering, there's quite a difference between the external and the internal. And so when we ask ourselves, what do we want to do with these teachings? And really in general, what do we want to do with our lives? Because we can spend our whole lives helping others. And then you have to ask yourself, what does that really do for me? What does that really bring? And what good would it do if everyone were trying to help other people, right? Well, it, it, there would be external goodness, right? There would also be a lot of problems and conflicts when people have different ideas of helping and when they get frustrated and burnt out because the others aren't amenable, right? We're all trying to help others, but no one's actually looking inside and fixing themselves, fixing their problems. And it's quite frustrating and fruitless, really. 
And so even with things like mindfulness and meditation, it's easy to talk about them and to understand them intellectually. It's even easy to sit down and, and sit still and close your eyes for ten minutes, half an hour, or even an hour. But to actually make that shift where you're actually practicing these things, where you're actually cultivating, in this case, contentment, which is very much a part of the meditation practice. In terms of our meditation, this means the cultivation of objectivity, where we stop reacting to things. When we see something we like, we learn to change that, so we just see it, and the liking doesn't arise. Why? Because we see that it's not worth liking. It's not even that we fix ourselves, but it's that we look at the world in a different way, we turn inward, or not even inwards really, we root ourselves in reality, in the present and the here and the now. We change from thinking about things abstract in terms of a room that I'm in and people and so on, to experiences, to the moment now. There's the sound of my voice, there's the feelings and this, there's the sights and so on. There's all of that and it's arising and ceasing. And when you actually look at that, not just hear what I'm saying and appreciate it intellectually and then maybe go and teach it to others, when you actually put that into practice, that's where the greatest benefit comes. That's where, that's where the teachings are meant to be. That's what it means to set yourself in something first. It's very easy to slip into this sharing with others, something that religious people do quite well. It's much more difficult to actually help yourself and so the Buddha was constantly reminding his followers, set yourself in what is right first. Because otherwise it's, it's, it's marred by that. If you go and help others, there's, it's never going to be pure. And we do this with everything, really. I mean, this is a, a way of explaining with anger, for example. When we're angry, we hold on to it, and we use it to speak, to act, Right? When we're greedy, when we're, we're craving something, when we have desire, we use the desire to reach for, to seek out, to strive out, strive after what we want. When we have delusion, we become all arrogant and conceited and so on. Instead of looking at these things themselves, we never actually look at the anger, the greed, the delusion. We never actually look at our experiences. <coughs> cleansing the source, the source of our actions and our speech and even our thoughts. And so it's this difference between, I mean, of course it's good to be out in the world helping, it's good to teach, it's good to share the Buddhist teaching, absolutely. But everything, your expression, is it's always going to be an expression of what you've got inside. So if you're an angry, bitter, greedy, arrogant person, um, even sharing the Buddha's teaching is not going to be pure. There's going to be, and even if it is, it's not really the, it's not the most wonderful thing to do with the Dhamma. It's not of any use to you. It might be of use materially. You become like Upananda and you get lots of robes and stuff. It's a great teacher. But you never become free from suffering. You never actually taste. The Buddha said you're like a, a shepherd who looks after the other people's ca uh, sheep. Right? You never actually get the products of the, the cows, a cow herd who never gets the milk. So, the lesson here is work on yourself. If you, even if your goal is to help others, purify the source. Because just like a river, the source of the river defines the quality of the water. If the source is impure, the river can never be pure. All of our actions and our speech and our deeds, actions, speech, our thoughts, they all depend on our, our purity, the source, the mind. If our mind is impure, we can't expect anything we do say or even think to be of benefit to us or benefit to others. And so our, that's, that's really what meditation is about. It's about this inner work this inner um, cultivation, the activity of
coming to purify the source, to set ourselves in what is right. Atanameva patamang. Atanameva patamang. Setting yourself in what is right first. Then, if you're going to teach, if you're going to share, if you're going to act in the world, just make sure you've got that purity and you won't defile yourself in your actions. You won't embarrass yourself. You won't regret all the things that you do with the lack of clarity and with the greed and the anger and the delusion. So there you go. That's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all the best.